Hi, welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic, where today's video we're going to look at one of the most important parts of improving Sudoku solving, uh, even for experts, and that is endgame logic. Um, so this is a viewer requested puzzle, um, and NJ who sent this in, he, he sent me the starting position, and he also sent me this position, which is on screen at the moment, which is the position where he got stuck, and he wants to know whether there is an elegant way of making progress. Now, I can't stress enough how important it is to train yourself. If you really want to improve at Sudoku, uh, looking at these endgame situations and trying to dissect them and understand the patterns that exist within them is so important. Um, and that allows us, once we get better at this, to look at positions like this and, and you can see several ways to make progress actually and I'm going to concentrate on two of them in today's video. Now the first is, is something we've seen a lot recently in, in other videos on the channel and it's this concept of an empty rectangle. Um, now one of the things that makes empty rectangles I think easier to spot is where we have situations like we see here in row 6 where we have a pair of numbers um, which are not in the same box uh, sitting across uh, a row or a column. Now if you get this position or this sort of situation there are a number of things you can think about looking for. You could think about looking for X-wings, you could think about looking for swordfishes, and you can think about looking for empty rectangles. And so let's remind ourselves what an empty, empty rectangle is. An empty rectangle is a situation where if we look at another box, i.e. a box that doesn't contain the 7-8 pair, we need to force one of these numbers, the 7 or the 8, to change. And let's look at this top uh, right-hand box in order to show you what I mean. So if we consider the possible positions of 7s in this box, I'm going to add some highlighting afterwards, but hopefully it's clear to everybody that the 7 is either forced into row 1, i.e. this 7 is correct, or it's forced into column 9, i.e. either of these 7s is correct. So one of those things must be true because we've eliminated the 7 possibility from this empty rectangle. So this 2x2 two two, um, array that my cursor is outlining here, this is the empty rectangle. In this case it's actually a square. Um, but there is no possibility of a 7 appearing within this rectangle. And that means, so this is the empty rectangle, that means the 7 is either in row 1 or column 9. And can you see how that affects the puzzle? Let's, th let's think about this. So either this 7 will be correct, in which case I'll get to eliminate this 7 in this position here, or one of these two 7s is correct, and we find ourselves uh, sort of then interacting with the 7-8 pair in row 6 because if either of these 7s is correct this is forced to be an 8 and this is forced to be a 7 so we get the situation that we get with an awful lot of these chaining strategies or empty rectangle strategies where we, we've managed to prove either this is a 7 or this is a 7 and sliding up the grid obviously both of these or both of these 7s are pointing at this square so this square could not be a 7 and we'd be able to remove it, we'd get a 3 in this position and that would tidy up the puzzle. So the empty rectangle is one way to make progress um, but th there is another way and we've done, a, we've done videos focusing on this um, this technique recently uh, and it, it's the skyscraper technique and here it's, it's, quite, it's quite a nice example actually because the skyscraper exists on two numbers. Now those of you who aren't familiar with skyscrapers, do take a look at our videos. Just search skyscraper, put in uh, a keyword search on the channel, and you'll find some videos discussing this. Um, now, a skyscraper can also be, I suppose, technically described as a sashimi finned X wing. So, um, you know, you, uh, you pay your money, you takes your choice as to which way you want to think about uh, this technique. Um, but you don't really have to know the name of it. You just have to get your brain into the right frame of mind for uh, asking the right questions when you see 
opportunities to do so. So what I want to look at firstly is, is the contents of row one. So in row one we have a, a pair of three sevens. Now again, when you get this sort of situation like we have with the seven eight down here, we need to think about how the fact that this is a pair interacts with other rows of the grid. Now, the, the great thing here is if, if we look at row row four of the grid, we have another 3-7 pair where one of these 3-7 uh, uh, cells is in the same column as the 3-7 pair that we have in row one. Now, the fact that there is this interaction between this square and this square is everything. That allows us to ask the right questions in order to, to make progress. So let's firstly see what I mean by thinking about um, what are the options for this square. This square, obviously, it can be a 3. Now, if it's a 3, we can scan down the column and we'd be able to eliminate 3s that appear in the, in the column. But what happens if it's not a 3? Well, if it's not a 3, we know this must be the 3 because there's only going to be, there's only two positions that can take a 3 remaining in row 1. So we know this will have to be the 3. And this is where the interaction with what's happening in row 4 matters. That forces this not to be a 3, and therefore this is a 3. So we end up with a situation where either this is a 3 or this is a 3. And that gives us the opportunity to hunt in the grid for cells that can see both this square and this square because we know any such square can't contain a three so there's only one actual candidate here that matters for this and that's this square this square cannot contain a three this one can still contain a three because although it sees this square it doesn't see this one and it's the fact that we know that either this one or this one is a three that matters now, of course, the reason I've, I've selected this, uh, this example to speak, talk through is that we've just done the trick here with the threes, but we have a, the opportunity to do exactly the same trick with the sevens because of the way that these sevens are, are arranged. They're arranged in the same way as the threes. So let's do the same trick now with the sevens to sort of reinforce the message. Now, if this is a seven, again, we can rule out sevens from the whole of the column. If it's not a 7, we know this will be a 7. Therefore, this won't be a 7. And we need to put a 7 in row 4, so this will be a 7. So, same logic, we're either going to have a 7 here or a 7 here. And that's going to affect this, this cell this time. Removing the 7 from this square forces it to be an 8. And you can see that's going to completely break the puzzle open. Once this is an 8, this is a 7, this is a 5, this is a 3, this is an 8, etc, etc. And the whole puzzle collapses. So, I wanted to run through this because I think it's a very good example of this. Now, one thing to bear in mind, it's made, it was made very simple here because we had three 7 pairs in all of these four positions, which uh, I think made, made it stick out a bit like a sore thumb. But we can put any numbers as in, in these, these squares. You know, let's fill them in. I haven't checked whether these numbers I've just filled in clash with, in fact, they do clash with, with the other numbers in the boxes. But the point I want to make is that the critical thing about this pattern is not the number that's accompanying the 7. It's the fact that the 7 itself is restricted to just two positions in the respective rows. So, I don't, in fact, you know, we can fill in loads of other numbers. I mean, in, in theory, you know, we could have lots of different opportunities but but the fact is that the seven in this row can only go in two positions the seven in row four can only go in two positions and in one of these columns the sevens interact and that's all you need in order to create the skyscraper pattern or sashimi thin next wing pattern as you like or even you can just think of it as a simple chain um, because that's the way that this logic works we simply ask ourselves the question what happens if this is a 7? What happens if it's not a 7? And we think about the consequences of that, and that is another way to crack this puzzle. So I hope that was a useful run through. Something a bit different today. I do think these sort of end game studies, if you like, are um, they're really important for in, improving everybody's uh, Sudoku solving, especially at the higher level. If you want to become a really expert solver, 
you have to be able to look at these uh, sort of very complete grids and work out how to make that next deduction. Um, it's a bit like I think a chess problem, you know, where somebody pre presents a chess end game and says, you know, work out how to mate in three or something. You know, look, presented with a very complete Sudoku, what's the next step to make make progress? Often I think the Sudoku is slightly easier in the sense that there's more than one way uh, to get to the final answer in these 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 finished positions. But it's very important that we get better at spotting how to do that. If you enjoy the content of the channel, we, we ask you to subscribe or give us a thumbs up or just leave a positive comment. It makes a lot of difference to us and we appreciate that. And we'll be back soon with another edition of Cracking the Cryptic.